Dr. Ted Downing in favor of the proposition. Thank you, Dr. Ted Downing. Are you going to give us some indications by with I hate this. Can you give us an indication with more than one finger? As far as I understand. Okay, that works. Okay. I didn't know I was going to do this. Okay, thank you. All right. I want to thank everybody for being here. And I see some people that I've dealt with for years and years and have been wonderful friends here. Uh, politically, we've had many battles together. I want to explain uh, and, uh, about the, the value of this particular proposition, this initiative, which is the, uh, and, and uh, Phil Lopes has already explained the, what the proposition will do. It will allow, it's a constitutional amendment, which has a higher standard for number of signatures, and it will allow all Arizonans, regardless of party affiliation, to vote in a single open primary for the candidate of their choice. The top two candidates will advance into the general election, and the current system of taxpayer-funded primaries will, uh, political party primaries will end partisan primaries. In a nutshell, what this does, it takes a system of elections that we already have had in Arizona for 100 years, the municipal and the district school board elections, with the exception of one city, and it takes those and lifts that election up, makes it general, the general election method for all legislative, state, and federal elections except the presidential primary. On the November ballot, this measure requires about 260,000 signatures. And I can report as of yesterday that we have 197,007 signatures. That's an historic record for any initiative in April. Our polling shows that if it's on the ballot, and we think it will be, because we have to finish our signatures by July 5th, at that point it will pass. And Arizona will join two other states, both Western, Washington and California, as having its representatives and its elected officials being elected by all of the constituents in their districts. That changes the composition of Congress itself, and the most important thing, it may change the national structure on other issues, such as election finance reform. There is an erosion right now, and I want to explain what this is really about, and I spent uh, a little bit of time studying this type of voting system. It's all about enfranchising voters and finding a better way that voters can express the consent of the government. Consent is expressed by voting, the way we do it. And a truly effective, meaningful voting system uh, means that all people are enfranchised, not just a few. The great progressive movement of, and the great heritage of America has been the expansion of the franchise. If you think of that, those very first elections for president, only landed white men could vote. And then it expanded 40 years or more until finally landless white men could vote. And then they extended it to black males. Finally, women could then vote, then Native Americans. And the last one I remember very well, and some of you do in the room, was we extended the right to vote to young people who could go to war in Vietnam, but couldn't turn, couldn't exercise the franchise. That's, I think, a great progressive history of America, no matter how you feel about what's happening to progressives right now. That's a great progressive history. The voting itself, the voting method that we use is based upon campaign financing. These are the four pillars, campaign financing, redistricting, election integrity, and our voting method. Now, I agree that all four of those issues are in need, are in suboptimal condition, especially that concerning campaign financing. But this initiative is not about campaign financing. It's not about redistricting. It's about the voting method. And there's strong indications that the will of the people is not being expressed, that Ironically, people from all sides of government, not just progressives, but people on the other side, are saying that government is disproportionately influenced by a minority. 
The Tea Party people, uh, the people are withdrawing, excuse me, their consent to be governed by occupying, by sipping tea, by turning away from the polls, by not returning their vote by mail ballots, by trashing the legislature and the Congress, by sending letters to the editor, and the most amazing form of protest of all, by changing their political identity to unaffiliated. That's equivalent to changing your religion, almost, for some. Uh, the, the numbers are truly amazing, and they, in, in Arizona, I'm just looking, in the last 80 months, I just did a little spreadsheet showing that there was a 10% increase in voters in Arizona in the last 80 months. Of that, 5% increase in Democrats, who now are ranked as the third largest group, a 6% increase in Republicans, and the largest growth rate was 21% increase in independents. That's something, what's going on is a re-registration of people changing identity. The, uh, I think that indicates, certainly, withdrawal of the consent of the government. And the independents are now becoming vocal, and they're feeling pretty strong about issues like their own disenfranchisement. The initiatives advantages, let me go through them real quickly. I see four main ones, there's more than that, but four. First, it changes the overall architecture of this thing, and some of you have heard me say this before, but the actual beginning of this initiative happened at Beyond Bread, where I wrote down a little equation, and I said on the napkin that parties have priority over candidates over voters. That's our current election system, Title 16. All we did in this initiative, and if you look at the way it's written, we turned it upside down. Voters take priority over candidates, they take priority over parties. That's how we changed it. This allows voters the right, the open, unrestricted right to vote for any candidate of their choice. The second major advantage is it enfranchises independent voters. What's wrong with independent voters right now? What are they complaining about? I'm an independent. If I want to vote in a political primary, I have to assume the identity and vote a straight party ticket to be the Democrat or Republican. That's a disenfranchisement of me. That's wrong. And you say, I have a right to express my opinion as long as I express it as either an R or a D. And I can't vote libertarian because they close their primary. And opening and closing that primary is up to the, uh, up to the parties themselves. Third, it expands voter choice. Rather than just voting for one or watching your candidate who was progressive lose to another Democrat at a primary, there's a chance that both of the, part, both of the candidates may emerge, depending on the redistricting area. And it ends the subsidy whereby two-thirds of the people receive a subsidy from the other one-third. Those of us that are independents actually are financing the political primaries of the, two, of the major parties. Will it work? Does it make a difference? Let me give you just one example. Mesa, Arizona, Russell Pierce. Russell Pierce was elected in a partisan primary with a very few, about 13,000 votes. They put him in and he feels he has, I know Russell, I've served with him and so did DeFill. He feels he has a mandate, not only from the voters, but from God. Uh, and the, and, but Russell had to run a second election in a recall, and this recall is exactly like the kind of election we're trying to propose. Everyone could vote. And when everybody can vote, and the franchise was extended, Russell Pierce lost. For that reason, we think this particular voting method better expresses the will of the people. And it's built on a system that the Arizonans understand. They voted this way over and over again in other, in their school board and, and, uh, and, and city elections, except in Tucson. The overall impact of this, should it pass? Are we good? You're good. OK, good. <laughs> the overall impact of this, uh, of should, should it pass, changes both the the way the candidate behavior, the voting behavior, the voter behavior, and the party behavior. We can go into some of those anticipated consequences. Some people have argued that this is kind of the, quote, the end of political parties. I can tell you, in the states where a system like this is operated, let's take Nebraska. 1934, Nebraska introduced this system for electing members of its legislature. Or the Nebraska senators keep their political identities, the Republicans and Democrats. 
What happens in the actual exercise? You could run as you wish. You could run as a Republican, a Democrat. <coughs> when I called some senators, I said, what does this mean? What happens to you if you're running? Their answer was that you run as a Democrat or Republican at your own risk. You have to reach your constituency. And from their point of view, they represent more, it, you get more of a constituency-based elector, elected person than one that's based on a party base. Inside the legislature, they break into caucuses, and they're not broken like R's and D's. They're broken into caucuses based upon particular issues. People that have very strong feelings about health care. Other people have very strong feelings about women's issues or education. And if you can pull together a caucus, a majority caucus on your issue, you have strength and power inside the legislature. Everyone doesn't have to stay to the same tool. It works. And the, they have a positive view of their own legislature. In terms of the reform itself, where it's happened in Washington State, which is a very good example, and probably uh, 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 Professor Volge and I will both be talking about what happened in Washington State, because it's, it's a harbinger of what may happen in Arizona. In Washington State, they had an open blanket primary forever. I think in about 35, no, about 45 years or so. The Republican and the Democratic Party sued, by the way, the parties do agree sometimes, and they certainly agree to sue against that. They, they sued, and as a result, it was declared unconstitutional, and for good reason. You shouldn't have people coming over voting in your primary, they could dilute it, things like that. It was declared unconstitutional. They had one primary that was then a partisan primary, so now you've got two systems of voting, and then Based upon a change in the legislature, they voted through a new system, which is like the one we're proposing in Arizona. Almost, there's some small differences. Based on that, Washington State now has a top two nonpartisan primary. And the results have been beneficial. They've been beneficial in the sense there hasn't been radical changes yet, but they at least have legislators and members of Congress who are, have to at least pay attention to minority votes. I'll give me one last example. Who's disenfranchised? It's not just the independents. You're disenfranchised. If you're a Republican living in a legislative district or congressional district that's heavily Democrat or vice versa, you're disenfranchised too. For the next 10 years, guess what? Your vote doesn't count. Your voice doesn't count. If you add together the independents, a third of the state now, with the disenfranchised minorities in those particular districts, you find that actually you have minority control of each legislative district and each congressional district close to it. So you have a lot of people disenfranchised, probably it's anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of Arizonans can't vote. And guess what? That translates into the low turnout, the protest, the feeling of disenfranchisement, and the fact that most people feel that they're elected, they're that only only 10% of the people feel that their elected representatives represent them. You know what? They're right. Lack of participation, why don't they show up? If you're an independent, why should you show up? That's the question. Why should you go vote? If you're a Republican in a Democratic district, don't you have a disincentive to show up and vote, or vice versa? Those are disincentives. That is not the American way. It's not the way that represents that long chain of progression that I gave you where we kept re-enfranchising other people and spending the franchise. That's what it's about, voter enfranchisement. In this country, we hope to make it clear that in the Constitution of Arizona, like America, it's based upon the concept of one person, one vote, not one party, one vote. Thank you.